Hey guys, this is Rudy coming at you live from Palm Beach in Florida. It is Sunday afternoon. It is about uh, three o'clock on uh, September the 3rd. I spent the uh, last few days going over some REITs, so real estate investment trusts, and um, figured, you know what, um, this is a great opportunity in an uncertain market to potentially invest in a variety of real estate investment trusts. But if you were to do so, the question is, which one should you choose? Now, for those of you who have been following the channel for some time, obviously I've made a few videos before where I've, where I've shared uh, some of the stocks and equities and other um, assets in my portfolio. And um, in this particular example here, I'm comparing five different properties, one of them AGNC, uh, perhaps a little bit more near and dear to me than the other four. Uh, but I figured in order to uh, provide a little bit of transparency and fairness, why don't we compare five of the uh, sort of top picks in terms of people who uh, spend a lot of time and, and put a lot of uh, their investable cash into real estate investment trusts or otherwise commercial property in general and uh, see what we can come up with in terms of picking winners and losers. So if you stay with me for this uh, video, what I'm going to do is give you a quick introduction to some of these companies, in fact, to all five of these companies, and then we're going to compare them one to the other uh, using bar charts. And then I am going to close it off by telling you which one of these, if any, I would make an investment in or not. Uh, so that's that's my tease to uh, keep you engaged. So uh, let's go. So um, you may or may not be familiar with these companies, Penn and Park, EPR Properties, Realty Income, AGNC, and Broadstone Net Lease Inc. So uh, let's dive in here and see what these companies are. So EPR Properties, uh, positions itself or markets itself as the diversified experiential REIT, REIT, R-E-I-T, Real Estate Investment Trust. Building the premier experiential real estate portfolio, $100 billion plus addressable market. What do they invest in, right? So they target experiential property types down here at the bottom of the screen, eat and play attractions, cultural gaming, experiential lodging, live venues, fitness and wellness and ski, etc. cetera. So, um, as a, at a glance, you can see that EPR invests in uh, properties or real estate or assets that are predominantly uh, liable uh, or subject to um, discretionary income, right? So for the majority of people who are working people, you earn your salary, you pay your taxes, and with what's left over, you pay your mortgage and your car and you buy food and you pay for insurance and things like that. And if you have any money left over, you might invest in one of the um, experiential property types and activities that EPR properties invests in. Now, for me being uh, maybe older than uh, many of the people watching this video, uh, experiential uh, an experiential REIT uh, relying on discretionary income is probably not where I wanna be, but it's different for everybody uh, in terms of your timeline, your age, your uh, earnings expectations, your risk profile, et cetera. So I can't talk to that. I can only speak about me. Broadstone Net Lease, the second company here, corporate profile, it says it has a long term. Uh, so these leases that they are that they are invested in, so commercial real estate properties that are leased on, a, leased on a long term basis to a diversified group of tenants. It's always good to have a bit of diversification. Um, if, for example, you invest only in uh, commercial real estate for uh, grocery stores, that's a that's not a bad thing because uh, obviously everybody has to buy groceries. Um, on the other hand, if you invest in something where it's a little bit more discretionary, like uh, let's say uh, movie theaters or something like that, um, well, that's a little bit of a, a tougher sell for someone like me because uh, that's much higher risk. And that's also the uh, reference or comment that I made to EPR properties on the previous slide. This is diversified not only in the United States across 44 different states, but also in Canada across various industrial, healthcare, re restaurants, retail, and office property types. Uh, this is more fitting with my type of risk profile and perhaps return, but let's uh, dive a little bit deeper. So I do wanna talk here just a little bit before I go into the uh, the rest of the presentation about a DRIP. So a DRIP is a dividend reinvestment program. If you have the ability to earn a high dividend and you don't require the income, in other words, when they pay you your uh, monthly or quarterly dividend, um, you don't necessarily need the cash uh, in terms of covering your living expenses, like I said, your mortgage and your, in, your car and your insurance and buying food and all that kind of stuff. So if you have the ability to invest it, enroll in an automatic drip, a dividend reinvestment program, and you can compound 
your uh, investment much, much quicker. Buying dividend paying stocks is one of the easiest and smartest ways to increase your health. Now, so your wealth, sorry, and your health for that matter. So um, if you look at the uh, information that I'm sharing with you here on the screen, this uh, report that I'm talking about here by JP Morgan Asset Management uh, was almost 10 years ago, but it doesn't really matter because it covered the period 1972. I'm sure the majority of people watching this video were, were not born in 1972 to 2012. That's a 40 year period. And what they did was they compared the return on investment of dividend income paying stocks compared to non-dividend paying stocks. Now the ROI of dividend income stocks crushed the non-payers 9.5% annualized versus 1.6% annualized for the non-payers over a four decade period. You might have heard some people before, including people that you might be familiar with, like Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, uh, who has said on multiple occasions, he will never invest in a stock that does not pay a dividend. I have a couple of stocks that don't pay dividends, but for the most part, my personal portfolio is invested in dividend paying stocks. Realty Income is a company that actually pops up on our channel fairly often. Many of you have asked questions about Realty Income before, especially when I talked about dividend paying stocks. So uh, if you look at Realty Income, this is a stock that pays more than 5% on an annualized basis. Um, now, one of the first questions you should ask yourself if you're investing in any dividend paying stock is, is this dividend sustainable, yes or no? Well, Realty Income, ticker symbol, O, not zero, as in zero dollars, but actually this is not zero dollars, this is the letter O. I have no idea why the ticker symbol is O, but that's what it is. They are a member of the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats Index. Uh, dividend Aristocrats is an interesting uh, concept that you can dive deeper into if you are interested in doing so, but basically sort of in a nutshell, these are companies that have sustainable dividends that they've been paying for a long, long period of time. Well, how long, Mr. Roxy? For more than 50 years, Realty Income has been delivering monthly dividends that increased over time. It's structured as a REIT, so a real, a real estate investment trust. And the monthly dividends, so it pays a monthly dividend, which is nice, are supported by cash flow from 13,100 real estate properties primarily owned under long-term net lease agreements with commercial clients. Now, very often people say, uh, should I invest in commercial real estate? Uh, for me, from a personal point of view, and remember everything that I'm sharing with you really relates to me, because as I said, I don't know your age, your risk profile, your earnings, your earnings potential, uh, your cost of living expenses. I don't know any of that stuff, right? So most of the time when I'm speaking, I'm just speaking for myself. People say, uh, Mr. Roxy, because many of you still call me Mr. Roxy, do you invest in real estate or do you invest in commercial real estate, so residential or commercial? The answer is predominantly no. I have invested in commercial and residential real estate before, uh, but I've managed to uh, be fortunate enough to uh, actually uh, just give some of my residential real estate away. And uh, at the same time, I've sold most of my commercial real estate interests over time. So uh, I actually own very little real estate at all. My primary two reasons for doing so is number one, liquidity. Uh, I prefer to invest in investments that uh, allow me to uh, basically pull the cash anytime I want, right? So in other words, if I, if I need to raise money, I don't want to wait a few weeks, months, or even a couple of years to sell a, a, a fixed property. I'd rather just turn it into cash like that. The other reason why I do this is because of mobility. So uh, for me, that uh, concept of liquidity tied with mobility, which allows me to be almost anywhere, uh, wherever I want to be in terms of just uh, achieving sort of freedom, if I could put it that way, uh, makes mobility very desirable for me. And mobility is uh, counterintuitive to uh, real estate, which is fixed. So I'm not anti real estate from a personal point of view. It's just not something that I want to invest in necessarily. There are also other reasons, just very, very briefly, and that is um, as the uh, federal taxation system, wherever you might be or wherever you might reside, whatever your jurisdiction is for tax purposes, as it changes, um, many, many things change uh, that you have no control over, like property taxes. Property taxes are levied by a local uh, assessor. Uh, depending on where you live, you know, your city or your county or your province or your state or something like that. So uh, in the case of where I live currently in Palm Beach, that would be the county. 
and I have no control over that. I do have the ability to vote in my county, but at the end of the day, the county can increase or decrease or do whatever they want with my property tax assessment anytime they want. I do not like uncertainty in my portfolio other than perhaps for stock risk or otherwise dividend paying risks. So back to realty income here. Right here at the bottom of the screen, Realty Income has declared 637 consecutive common stock monthly dividends throughout its 54-year operating history and increased the dividend 121 times since their IPO, an IPO is an initial public offering, in other words, when the company went public in 1994. So a fantastic track record uh, offering you a more than 5% yield paid on a monthly basis. Not too bad. Penn and Park, is another topic for many of the hedge funds and other people who invest in uh, REITs. Uh, interesting company, and what makes it really interesting is this floating rate capital. And I'm going to tell you more about that in just a second. $18.2 billion of assets under management, 680 plus investments, 220 partnerships with private equity sponsors, etc. You know, it's a uh, relatively big business. It's in billions, right? So what is a floating rate capital company and what is Penn and Park specifically? It's a business development company. Company, So it's structured like a REIT, but it's actually a BDC or business development company. It invests primarily in equity or debt. Now, in the case of uh, PFLT, so this is Penn and Park's uh, ticker symbol, they hold $155 million in common and preferred equity, but $950 million in debt investments. In other words, Penn & Park is really a debt-focused business development company. Now, much like uh, where I started the um, uh, presentation and I said, I don't really like uh, companies that rely on people's discretionary income. I also don't really like companies that invest primarily in debt for a variety of different reasons. And you can do a deeper dive on this one yourself if you're interested in doing so. The yield for middle market companies is unproven. And middle market companies, by definition, if I can take you back up to the top here, are small to mid cap companies, which are collectively referred to as middle market companies. It's unproven. This means that access to traditional debt or credit for these middle market companies is somewhat scarce or limited. PFLT then achieves above market rates on the debt it holds. So basically what they're doing is they're going to smaller to mid-sized businesses and saying, you don't have the ability to go to market and raise capital at preferred rates. So what we will do is we will provide the capital to you but at a higher, higher rate. And most of those companies are so desperate for cash, they will just say yes. A classic or typical or common example of this would be like mining companies, not in the case of Penn and Park, but just in general. Mining companies are always looking for cash. As of June the 30th, PFLT generated more than 12% weighted average yield on its debt investments and is currently paying its investors more than 11% on an annualized basis. A floating rate capital company, all of the $950 million in debt portfolio is at a variable rate. I don't like that either because it's unpredictable, right? So every time the Fed hikes the rates, PFLT's net in interest income also gets hiked, which means the reverse is true too. So if the Fed does nothing or starts easing rates or cutting rates, that, that advantage is reversed. So for this particular reason, and the one I just mentioned on the previous uh, slide where I said that they are primarily invested in small to mid cap company debt, uh, PFLT kind of sits skew with me. That's probably not a company I would invest in. Their uh, security in terms of this uh, large portfolio of debt, $950 million in debt investment, um, only $100,000 of it, in other words, almost nothing. Uh, is not secured by a first lien. So the majority of their portfolio, they have first liens on. So if the company doesn't pay the debt, then PFLT can simply either take the uh, the building or take the uh, shop fixtures and fittings or whatever it might be because they have liens against the um, uh, debt holders in place, uh, which provides them with a level of security. Now, of course, if you wanted to take legal action against them, you cannot get blood from a stone and if they're bankrupt and they have no money, you're probably not going to get anything either, but at least they have a lien in place to give them some coverage. Very quickly, before I go into the comparison, let's talk about AGNC. AGNC is much more familiar to me. It's been in my portfolios for a long, long time, man, more than a decade. This is an internally managed mortgage real estate investment trust. So it's a pure, simple REIT uh, for the people who are much more risk averse, perhaps, than uh, most stock market investors. 
You might remember going back to 2008, we learned about mortgage-backed securities and asset-backed commercial paper, saw the collapse of Lehman Brothers and companies like that. So um, what we're looking for here is some safety and security. And actually, AGNC kind of offers this. If you want me to do a deeper dive on AGNC, I will gladly do so because it's in my portfolio. So I don't mind doing homework. It benefits you because it benefits me at the same time. Their active portfolio management philosophy is intended to preserve our net asset value across a wide range of market scenarios. So uh, this company is very interesting to me. It's been yielding over 14% of late. Uh, it's had double digit um, yields for last for the last 13, 14 years, which is pretty good. So the lowest yield it's had over the last 13, 14 years has been about 10%. The stock performance is awful, right? So um, these guys are just getting hammered. What they do is they um, borrow money at the lowest possible short-term rate and use that capital to purchase higher yielding long-term assets like mortgage-backed securities. The recent inversion of the treasury yield curve, which is still ongoing, and Fed rate hikes have sent short-term borrowing costs higher and reduced AGNC's net interest margin. And that's one of the reasons why the stock price is horrible. But the treasury yield has been disproportionately inverted for a long time already and nothing lasts forever, right? So somewhere along the line, this is going to reverse. When this inversion ends, issuers like AG and C should enjoy higher interest margins. Higher interest rates help to lift the average yield on newly purchased mortgage-backed securities. And over time, this will help to lift the net interest margin. They have about $58 billion in assets under management and only one billion, similar to my previous example on Penn and Capital, is not tied up in agency MBS. An agency asset is backed by the federal government in case of default. So um, almost the entirety of their $58 billion in investment portfolio uh, is backed by the federal government. Now, to be fair, if the federal government collapses in a big heap of debt and folds like a cheap tent, then pretty much everything collapses anyway. But for now, uh, the investments that AGNC has made and the dividend yield that you're earning as a result is basically backed by the uh, federal government of the United States. Let's compare them quickly and uh, I won't keep you much longer. So um, if we look at the, the actual companies, they are similar, but not necessarily exactly the same. So at the bottom of the screen here, you can see I've uh, told you the company names and you can see that uh, Realty Income is an equity trust. And then PFLT, Pennant Park is an, a finance or investment management company. AGNC is also a real estate investment trust, which invests in mortgages. EPR is very similar to Realty Income, but much smaller. And uh, Equity, um, sorry, and Broadstone is also an equity trust, but more residential. The technicals, uh, this is always interesting for the technical guys, uh, basically just to sort of refresh your memory, if, it, if the 20-day uh, raw stochastic score is greater than 80, this uh, is an indicator to us that the uh, stock has been oversold. So, um, sorry, overbought, wrong way around. And if it's less than 20, then uh, it is basically uh, oversold. So uh, this creates a buying opportunity for us, potentially, if you look at the stochastic score specifically on realty income, and basically they are saying, uh, we've sort of hit the, uh, the top or the ceiling here on AGNC and EPR, uh, and uh, too many people have been buying this. Uh, ironically, even though that's a technical indicator, the same analysts who uh, create the technical indicators are basically saying uh, with these two um, REITs over here, one at 82, the other one at 87, one is uh, almost entirely sell and the other one's almost entirely buy in terms of today, previous and last month's opinion. At the bottom, you can see the ratios. I like the uh, price earnings ratio much more than the stochastic because at least we can... Uh, Look at it on a quarterly basis. This is a trailing 12 month ratio. If it's below 15, it's likable. So uh, realty income is interesting for me here. Uh, as same with these, they're sort of cheap. The cheapest of the lot based on its price earnings ratio only would be AGNC at 3.34 over a trailing 12 month period. The performance doesn't really matter much. There's not much in this year. Some of them are up 10%, some of them are down 10% over the past six months or whatever. Um, if you purchase, uh, uh, an investment like a you know a commercial building or uh, even a residential property uh, which is going to be an asset remember assets are things that make you money so if you buy a house 
that you live in, it's a liability, but if you buy a house and you rent it out, for instance, as an Airbnb, or if you buy a property and it's a hotel and you're making money every day, that's an asset, right? Um, you're not buying it for a performance based on five days, one month, three months, whatever. Uh, that's highly, highly unlikely. That's not why we buy property, so I'm not too interested in that. What I'm looking at here very briefly is the market capitalization of the company compared to its annual sales. So I take these two numbers and I say here, for example, we have approximately $3.3 billion in sales and a $39 billion market cap, uh, which gives me a multiple of eight. So this company, Realty Income, with its ticker symbol O, uh, is basically currently um, doing or generating $3.3 billion in sales with a market cap of $39 billion, which is an 8.3 times multiple if you compare sales to market cap, or sometimes say I talk about price to book, sales to book, et cetera, whatever the case might be. The others are much greater, but this is quite normal for a, a REIT style company to be in the teens or even early 20s, like in the case of AGNC over here. This is always a good indicator to me. It's very interesting. If you're looking to uh, buy into any of these prior to their next dividend date, the only one that's available to you is Broadstone because their uh, next X dividend date is September 28th. So you need to get into the position before then. Uh, I don't think I would buy that, but I'll come back to that at the end of this video. If you look at the uh, chart over, over a one-year period, all of them have underperformed the indices as well as um, the uh, you know other equity investments that you could have invested in, with the exception of EPR, which is only up slightly. So uh, this is not a great performance, but we don't buy these for the stock price. We buy them for the yield. Realty Income Corporation, ticker symbol O, you can buy for about 56 bucks. It is a large cap blend. Uh, these companies are financial companies. They're not uh, real estate companies. So in the sector that it trades in, it's finance, finance, not real estate. $40 billion market cap is sitting way to the left of center here. So this looks to me like it could be a buy. Uh, on its recent trailing 12-month PE ratio based on gap, the PE ratio is high for me here. So it's a little bit rich. It might pull back a little bit more, but we don't know. Uh, but Given the company's track record, you could probably almost say uh, this one is relatively uh, safe. Nothing is safe, but this one is not a bad buy, yielding 5.5%. And you can see almost 78% invested by institutions. The uh, The next one we want to look at, sorry, and I skipped one there, was Penn & Park. You can buy Penn & Park for about 10 bucks. It's sitting in the middle of the 52-week uh, range. This particular company is a small cap value in the financial sector, $636 million market cap. Negative earnings, nice dividend, 10%, more than 10%, currently yielding $1.18 on a $10 stock. And as I said a minute ago with the REITs, they've all been underperforming. AGNC, you can pick this one up for $10 as well. It's sitting sort of in the mid-range, in the middle of its 52-week range. This one's also a small cap value. $6 billion market cap, negative earnings, nice dividend, $1.44, uh, yielding currently at the stock price of almost 10 bucks, 14.46. And at the bottom of the screen here in the middle, you can see slightly higher shorts. So there are a number of people who think AGNC will still pull back a little bit from this $10. So if you get lucky and you get your timing right, you might be able for, to buy it for you know $9.50 instead of $10. EPR, Essential Properties Realty Trust, you can buy for 25 bucks. It's also a small cap blend. It's a $3.8 billion company. Uh, it's got positive earnings, pays a nice dividend yield, $1.12 on a $24 stock. is currently yielding 4.65, sitting just to the right of center, you know, and it's been sort of performing in line with the indices, the uh, major indices here, the Dow Jones, S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. Broadstone, last one. Uh, you can currently buy into Broadstone for 16 bucks. It's sitting way to the left in its 52-week range, so there might be a little bit of upside there. It is also a small cap blend with a market cap of $3 billion, positive earnings, and a super nice dividend share of $1.12 on a $16 stock, which currently yields about 7%, almost. So I'll wrap it up for you here. And uh, I have three big red Xs here. I will not, uh, for different reasons, uh, dive any deeper into Pennant Park EPR properties or Broadstone net lease. But the uh, two question marks there, and the reason why I didn't give it a green check mark, but rather gave it a green question mark, is because I would consider investing in realty income or AGNC, or alternatively, if I had an existing position, 
in any one of these, I might consider adding a little bit more stock at this time because the price arguably is relatively low. Now, in the case of realty income, I said it has a price earnings ratio of um, over 40 for the trailing 12 months. So this is not very attractively priced, whereas AGNC has a price earnings ratio of only 3.3. So uh, of the five that I've shared with you, um, you know, parking some uh, cash, especially if it's cash awaiting investment. In other words, I have some money in my investment account and right now it's just sitting there doing nothing, which means it's actually losing money. If I had to invest in, in anything at all and I wanted to park some of that cash into REITs, I might say, you know what, of the five that I just shared with you, AGNC and Realty is, um, you know, those two are probably the, the, the most likely candidates for me to invest some cash into. Which one would I buy? Well, that, that's actually not really a tough question. If I had, you know, $10,000 to invest or $100,000, doesn't matter what the amount is, I might say, you know what, instead of buying one of them, I'll buy a little bit of each. And if you really, really are risk averse, you could say, I might buy uh, a little bit of AGNC, one third, a little bit of realty income, one third, and keep the other third in cash so that you have uh, some powder dry for if they pull back a little bit more so that you can add some more to your existing position. But remember the cash awaiting investment in your account is earning you nothing and cash is declining on a daily basis, even though it's in small little increments, uh, whilst your investments, even if the stock goes down, can still offer you a very generous and uh, very lucrative yield uh, that will right size your portfolio, especially if you can hold it for a, a few years or so. Some of these stocks like AGNC are close to 15% in dividends. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is just purely from a mathematical point of view. If you can generate 15% per year, your assets under management or your invested cash uh, will double every five years. That's got nothing to do with AGNC. It's just math. If you compound at 15% per year, you double your investment every five years. Now, that is significant because... You know, $100,000 becomes $200,000, becomes $400,000, becomes $800,000, becomes $1.6 million. And I just doubled it five times, right? So for the majority of people on this channel, uh, you have five multiples of five years that you could possibly invest because if you are 20 or 25 years old and you uh, hold these high dividend yielding stocks uh, in five-year increments, by the time it's well over a million dollars, if you can uh, generate... Uh, that type of a compounded return, your um, age at that point in time might only be 45 or 50. So uh, on that happy note, this is um, Rudy signing off saying thanks for watching. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.